Now in the last programme we spoke about motorbikes in the early part of the century, but what about scooters? Yes, scooters, they really did exist in 1919. This is an ABC, a scooter motor as it's called, with a little engine at the back, 125cc, do all of 22 miles an hour, so you have to watch what you're doing on that one. But if you didn't want an engine at the back, you could have an engine at the front on this Staffordshire pup. Engine stuck on that side, on the left-hand side of the bike, flywheel on the other side, crankshaft ran straight through the middle, but it must have made the steering incredibly heavy. 150cc, a bit more luxurious, so the blurb says. But what about if you wanted one of these? No seat on this one, you literally scooted along on this one, so you just stepped away, put your feet on there, and away you went. Engine under the middle there. This is a Kingsbury, but um, not exactly in the Vespa mould, but nevertheless it's there, just like a modern street yuppie. But enough of scooters anyway. See this? Rally. Yes, the same people make rally bicycles because motorbikes wear these big bicycles. But there were some significant changes. 1921 this is, flat twin, 700cc, very neat motor, but it's getting quite substantial. But look at this at the back, it's actually got swinging arm rear suspension. No coil springs, this one's a leaf spring, just like an older car. Little grease nipple on there as well, but a proper swinging arm suspension. And when you think we didn't see those again until the mid-50s, makes you wonder where they went in the meantime. Also got a gearbox, a little three-speed gearbox, operated by this hand change here, and a kickstarter, because up until then, you either pedalled the motorcycle to get it going, or ran alongside and bump-started it. So these were sort of fairly modern things they were bringing in in 1921. But if you look up the front here, See this front brake? This is a brake block, again like a bicycle, but operating within that rim there. So it's not really very substantial to stop a bike like this. So when did proper brakes come along? Well, by 1925, Velocet, couldn't resist that, they developed a little drum brake. Look at that, it's tiny, but this was only a little bike, a little 250cc two-stroke. But there it is, in all its splendour, tiny little thing, what's that, about a four-inch drum? But nevertheless, they'd taken away this bicycle brake block thing and you had a proper drum brake, proper brake shoes within there. So that was a, another step forward. Talking about moving forward, people were developing all sorts of ideas. And in 1925, we had this, it's called the Nera car. It sounds like nearly a car, but in fact, it was named after the American designer, made in Sheffield. But this was a bike with a 350cc engine. But the significant thing is this front end here, because this, if you can see it, is hub centre steering in all its glory. Not too long ago, Yamaha came out with their GTS which had this. The bike failed, but nevertheless, this steering is very clever because the bike remains as a stiff chassis unit, no front forks as such, and the wheel just moves under this absolutely enormous guard. Didn't last for too long, and people are still having trouble developing the idea today. Now, bikes have been developing nicely in all sorts of ways, but one thing that hadn't developed much was the front suspension. Take this 1930 BSA 500, very recognisable as a big motorcycle, but these front forks are pretty crude. They're girder forks because they look like girders. See, it's just this tubing welded together, big central spring, and they're just hinged on these points here, and they have this centralised damper just to stop a bit of pattering because there were no hydraulics in those days. But someone else had other ideas for much better suspension. And that company was Scott. Now, they're probably more famous for their high-performance two-stroke twins, but look what they did. In 1929, they came up with this, a telescopic front fork. You've still got an outrigger here of a big, solid um, tube, but here you've got your plunger, comes to this fork here, and then a central unit which had the spring in. No hydraulics, but it is the first example of a telescopic front fork. You know, looking at my check sheet here, it's going to be impossible to cover every bike here because there's about 750 of them. But what I've tried to do is show you the way bikes have developed since the turn of the century up until around the 1930s. That's suspension and brakes and all that sort of thing. But there were engines to think of too. And see this matchless here, 1931 this matchless was, 600cc, but that engine is a V4 and it's overhead cam. It preceded Honda's VFR 750 by what, 50, 60 years or whatever. Very, very modern. The rear suspension on it too, you can probably just see that big coil spring, the whole rear end is cantilevered, so that had fully operational rear suspension. Coming up to the front here, it's even got the first instrument binnacle that you've ever seen on, uh, on a bike. So things were still getting pretty modern. Still got the old forks there, but how much is this one going to cost you? There it is, 1931, 75 pounds. 
So it's 1932 and you've got £170 in your pocket and fancy a new motorbike? Well, how about this? Yes, 170 quid, but this was in the 1930s. But this was a luxury motorcycle then, Bruff Superior SS100. In fact, the same bike that Lawrence of Arabia rode, and if you saw the film, he got killed on one of these, not this one I hasten to add. 1000cc JAP, the old Jap V-twin, massive thing there. And look at these beautiful twin pipes here coming out to these fishtails at the back, very fashionable in the 30s. No suspension, it's got the old castle type front forks, but a rigid rear. The only suspension you've got is the seat, but uh, what a bike, pretty impressive. Something to impress the ladies, I reckon. Skipping a few years, but still in the 1930s, 1937, Triumph shook the world with this, their famous speed twin. Why was it famous? Twin cylinder engine, 500cc, iron barrel, alloy bottom end, but a really lightweight engine and a lightweight frame. In fact, the whole bike only weighed 378 pounds, which is about 170 kilos, the weight of an R1. But then in the 30s, this was really something special. It went well and it handled well. Nothing fancy in the suspension, girder forks, rigid rear end, just a big springy seat, but it was a nice, neat bike. And this would have cost you just £74. Mind you, what I should have said, the speedometer would cost you another £2.15. shillings. A Royal Enfield, there's a name to conjure with. In fact, that engine, I'm sure you'll recognise it as the modern, up-to-date India Enfield of today. And that's as it started at 350cc, 1948, got some very swish looking front forks on that because the Second World War had interrupted bike development in general and so we ended up after the war with people making utility bikes but bringing them up to date. BSA was another example. This one, this beautiful BSA A7 looking absolutely pristine here. 500cc, twin cylinder, cast iron engine. In fact this had been developed in 1939 hard on the heels of Triumph Speed Twin but in fact they couldn't get it finished in time, so the war slowed things down, so they came with this straight out of the box. And doesn't it look a neat and tidy bike? Now in the 1950s, all the major manufacturers were playing around trying to sort out a decent rear suspension. Royal Enfield came out with this nice 500 twin, it's got telescopic front forks, but look here at the rear. You've got a proper swinging arm rear suspension there, and proper shock absorbers, hydraulic at that. Whereas Triumph took a slightly different view. 1952, they had this, the Speed Twin, but within that rear hub, this was called a sprung hub because there was actually a spring inside the hub itself and the wheel had to move up and down with a very small space. Not very effective really, didn't last for too long. But then other manufacturers had other ideas. Aerial, for instance, in the early 1950s, in fact, on this 1950 500cc twin, the rear suspension on this, unlike the others, this is plunger rear suspension, where there's a spring in this housing here, a very tiny linkage there, as the back wheel goes up and down, moves up and down, compresses this spring. Makes for a very solid frame, even if the movement's a little bit limited. But next to it, we've got a Douglas, famous old name, you don't see those anymore, but the rear suspension on this uses a swinging arm, as you can see there, but there's a tiny linkage down to the bottom there because this uses a torsion bar. That's a spring steel bar inside the frame tube, and that action actually twists the bar. It was very, very similar to the old Morris Minor front suspension, if you know your old motors, and that used a torsion bar in the front and got your spring action just like that. Very neat. Now, by 1954, Triumph were really getting their act together and they came out with this, this Speed Twin, 500cc twin, as I've said, cast iron engine. Up here, that very distinctive Triumph nacelle for the headlamp. It's got the speedo in there and the amateur and the headlight switch and these swept back bars. But perhaps more importantly, look at the rear. There we've got swinging arm rear suspension. And by then, all the major manufacturers were on this swinging arm bandwagon. And in fact, all of these bikes then started to look like the classic British bike, the ones that collectors collect even today. But I'll tell you what, there's so many here and there's BSAs and there's Nortons, we're just going to have to save those for another day.